All right, guys, uh, today we're in Mark chapter 4. Uh, this chapter has 41 verses, and I'm actually going to try and teach it all in, in one uh, sitting, but uh, hopefully it'll keep it around the usual, around 45 minutes. But in this chapter, there is the very important parable of the sower, along with a couple other parables, a uh, parable of the mustard seed in the kingdom, and uh, also there is the event at the end of this chapter of uh, Jesus rebuking the wind and the sea, uh, telling it to be still and, and showing his authority over uh, the natural world uh, creation. And so that's going to be the thrust of this section. And uh, we're going to do a deep dive into some of the theological things that we can extract from these passages and, and hopefully apply to our lives um, if, uh, if we're walking with Christ. So uh, chapter 4, verse 1 says, again, he began to teach by the lake. Again, within context, if you've watched the preceding videos of the preceding chapters, this is the Sea of Galilee, which uh, it is kind of like a lake, uh, even though it's called the Sea of Galilee. Again, he began to teach by the lake. Such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the lake and sat there uh, while the whole crowd was on the shore by the lake. This uh, is becoming a, a normal thing in the ministry of Jesus uh, in which people are so uh, zealous to touch him, so zealous to be right up in his face that he can't do his core mission, which again is to preach is what he tells us. The, the reason he was here is for uh, preaching the kingdom of God, to preach repentance. And so they put him in a boat. Uh, the disciples do. Uh, some call this the uh, the sower's uh, cove, but uh, and some say this was because of acoustics in that particular section so that he could be heard well. But nevertheless, uh, he is distancing himself from the large crowd that is uh, almost like a mob seemingly trying to overtake him. And so uh, he distances himself so that uh, he's not got people all over him while he's trying to teach. And it says uh, in uh, verse 2, it says, He taught them many things in parables, and in his teaching uh, said to them, and he'll go on to say the parable, but a parable is like a short story. It's something that uh, when someone is trying to teach you something, we often use these, uh, maybe not as much as Jesus did, but we'll use these when we're trying to explain a, a complicated subject uh, to someone, we put it into their language. Uh, we put it into something that they would understand and then pull out what we're trying to teach them. So we may use a sports analogy or maybe an analogy of uh, all kinds of things. There's so many things that we, we can use this. Uh, we do this with kids, uh, with teenagers, with all kinds of people to teach them things. And so Jesus uses lots of par uh, parables. And we're going to talk about actually in this chapter, he explains why he uses parables. And that's very uh, vital and essential to know uh, that he did use parables and why he used parables for all of his teaching it said that he didn't teach without parables so it's really interesting when you get into the mind and heart of christ so he taught them many things in parables and in his teaching said to them listen verse three a sower or someone who scatters seed went out to sow or to scatter seed verse four as he sowed some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. It sprang up at once because the soil was not deep. Uh, when the sun came up, it was scorched, and because it did not have sufficient root, it withered. Other seed fell among the thorns, and they grew up, and it choked it, and it did not produce grain. But other seed fell on good soil and produced grain, sprouting and growing. Some yielded 30 times as much, some 60, and some 100 times. And he said, whoever has ears to hear had better listen. So this is a really interesting passage. What I want you to see here is, and this is important, this is all the crowd gets. This is the whole sermon. That's it. This is, hey, if you have ears to hear, like this is really important, bye. Uh, see you next Sunday, all right? Uh, th this is the whole message. And uh, as we'll see in this chapter, he goes on to explain it exhaustively to his uh, disciples, 
But for the crowds, he doesn't explain everything and he teaches in parables, which like I said, uh, we will we'll talk about that some more um, in the later verses. And here, all I have is, uh, I was just referencing a passage in Hebrews, which we'll come back to um, after, um, maybe we explain the, the parable. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm going to explain the parable, which is verse 13. We're going to kind of jump around this. Um, and uh, that's verse 13 through uh, 20. And uh, then we'll come back and then address uh, verse 10 through 12 and 13 and explain why he used parables. So let's first focus on this parable. Uh, what we see in his explanation to the crowd is that there is four types of uh, soils, if you will, that uh, seed lands on that a sower throws. And that, that's about all you can get. And he goes into detail about uh, why certain soil maybe is really good and other soil, different things happen in these different soils. And um, so um, after uh, explaining the, the purpose of his parables, um, he says to his disciples, and now this is uh, in private. Notice verse 10, when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. He said to them, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So this is happening after the message. Um, and he is explaining in detail to the show, uh, excuse me, to the 12 and to the other disciples, the other uh, members of followers of Jesus that weren't among the 12 that were asking him, for further teaching on this matter, for some understanding. And so he says, verse 13, he said to them, don't you understand this parable? He seems almost perplexed that they didn't get it. Then how will you understand any parable? He's, he's frustrated a little bit because they're not understanding and he's seeming to say that this is one of the easier parables. He says, uh, verse 14, he goes on to explain it. The sower sows the word these are the ones on the path where the word is sown. Whenever they hear, immediately Satan comes and snatches the word that was sown in them. So what we see is that the, the sower, the one casting seen, is the gospel preacher. Um, in, in this context, of course, it is Jesus, but this is more of a timeless evangelistic principle that we can take and learn from Jesus' example and his teaching uh, to see how the uh, various types of people respond to the gospel. And uh, this may not be an exhaustive list, but it seems to be a summative list of, of the major themes and responses we get uh, with gospel preaching. So he says, whenever they hear, um, immediately Satan or the devil or the adversary, uh, the evil one comes and snatches the word that was sown in them. Okay, so that's all the teaching that we're giving con concerning this. Um, so we're not told, which has greatly troubled me, uh, that I don't have an answer for it. We're not told how Satan comes and snatches the word. We're just told that he does come and snatch away the word. So we don't know if there is something spiritual at work here. I mean, clearly, yes, it's something spiritual. Clearly it's Satan at work, but, but we don't know the exact means. Some have ventured to say that as Satan is the father of lies, that people are immediately believing certain lies that are passed around about Jesus and so that as soon as they hear the word, uh, they are already believing the lies and so the word dies. That's a very possible explanation. Uh, also, I, I uh, tagged um, a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Um, just wanted to read this uh, really briefly. But even if our gospel is veiled, this is Paul teaching, it is veiled or covered or hidden only to those who are perishing, among whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, so that they would not see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. And so, uh, again, not an exhaustive answer to this. One type of the four types of soil are people response to the gospel. But clearly, um, Paul sees a spiritual dynamic in, in which Satan, as the ruler of the, of the world, uh, the ruler of the darkness in the world. Uh, he, in a certain sense, has blinded eyes, blinded minds, blinded hearts uh, to people who even may come in close proximity to Christ. I, I've seen this take place. It's um, bewildering to see someone come in such close contact with the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, 
maybe even the miraculous things of the Holy Spirit, and to still reject the gospel. But this does happen, and, and the explanation of the scriptures, so far as I know, is limited, but, but says it's the work of Satan. And, and we're not told exhaustively how, but we are, are given insight that, that Satan has a, there's a spiritual dynamic to this in which he, he literally has blinded eyes and hearts. Um, and of course, uh, people's uh, choice takes, takes part in this dynamic as well, but, but I'm sure they're working together uh, for this. So I just wanted to mention that. So um, that's all we're told, that uh, Satan comes and snatches the word uh, that was sown in them immediately. So um, it's like uh, speaking to a brick wall. Uh, this does happen. Um, so if you are a Christian, you're called to share the gospel and you're called to faithfully uh, preach the gospel. And so this should be highly relevant to you. If you're a Christian and you've never shared your faith with anyone, also there needs to be some thought as to what exactly the gospel is that we're sharing. I'd like to do way more content on that. For now, I'd just like to say Ray Comfort has some really good books that cover this, Hell's Best Kept Secret, uh, the Way of the Master. Uh, these are very helpful books. Also, his YouTube channel is very helpful, Living Waters. Um, I'd encourage you to check that out. Maybe, Lord willing, we'll deal with evangelism exhaustively and extensively at a, a later time. But so this, this is helpful uh, for, for us as God's people who are trying to be obedient. Also, I just want to mention, I did some research uh, before I taught this, and I know I'm teaching this in the middle of the parable, but we'll get right back to it. But uh, said that in uh, February of 2019, Barna Research did um, a series of polls and found that close to 50% of millennials thought it was morally wrong. Christians, by the way, these are Christians, um, found it morally wrong uh, for a Christian to share their faith with someone who didn't believe. Uh, I, I almost made me sick to my stomach. Again, this was in February of 2019. You can look it up. Uh, but I just found it really sad how, how much uh, Satan has blinded the eyes of uh, the world. And, and even those who profess Christ, and, and might I say that um, if hell is eternal, if it's a literal fire that is unquenchable, uh, it would actually be evil to not share the gospel with somebody. So that's me pushing them back against that. But, but as the culture continues to influence our world, um, and influence uh, the church. Uh, we're going to continue to see itching ears that want to be scratched and people wanting to compromise. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but uh, God is not pleased with any of this, and, and God is not mocked. He's not fooled with what's going on. Um, and so uh, we should be ready to do whatever, to be willing to give an account before God and, and not before our culture. Verse 16, the second type of soil, he explains, he says, um, these are the ones sown on rocky ground. As soon as they hear the word, they receive it with joy. Um, but they have no root in themselves and do not endure. Then when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, immediately they fall away. This one is really, really important uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason is in the American church in... Um, the American Evangelical Church, sometimes we are so trigger happy with baptizing someone, we're so trigger happy with proclaiming someone saved or, or a Christian to some degree. Uh, sometimes it's even so slight, all it has to be is a, a almost ritualistic, like repeating of a prayer, repeat this prayer after me, or close your eyes, no one look around, raise your hand. And then immediately after just these simple actions of raising the hand, right, as if not being paralyzed is how you become a Christian. Um, then, then you become a Christian and, and, and we, oh, this person got saved, we bless it. This is so foreign to the scriptures. This is so foreign to a biblical theology of salvation. Um, and it really flies in the face of Jesus' teaching. That's why I'm bringing this up. Because one of the soils he's telling us right now, of the four, there's the good soil, there is the really uh, unresponsive soil, and then the other two soils are those that there is response, but then there is apostasy. So let's talk about this. So the one sown on rocky ground, picture rocky soil. Uh, likewise, as we were talking about the one sown on the path, think of uh, maybe before we had all the machines there, uh, and this is still happens all the time everywhere across the earth. People uh, sow 
plants and vegetation and do farming in lines. And so there's a line of vegetation and then a path uh, to where they can walk and then another line and then another path. And so Jesus is giving this example of scattering seed and some of it lands in different ways, but some that lands on the path, it's hard soil, it's packed down. And in his analogy, that's what it is. And then in the explanation, it's the work of Satan in the world in various ways and degrees. He doesn't exactly spell it out. The next kind of soil is the rocky soil. So it's, it's soil that may be somewhat good, but the exception of having rocks in it. And if you know, uh, this is a, a very um, literal thing that, that can happen. Uh, seed is scattered on rocky ground and the roots can't get down to get the nutrients, to get the, the water, uh, to get the life-staining, sustaining anchoring uh, to the ground. And so when that happens, you will still see grass or any kind of, you know, whatever your kind of seed you're sowing. The only thing I've ever done is grass, so that's what I can relate it to. But uh, you can still see life, signs of life. So um, this, it says that they receive it with joy, right? So that's a good response. If, if I'm preaching on a Sunday and someone comes up and is like, man, this is awesome. I, Jesus sounds great. I mean, this is all what we would um, uh, deem as a great response to the gospel message. But Jesus tells us not to be so quick to trust our hearts to the hearts of men. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't trust himself. Uh, the way of the master was very different in regards to evangelism. And so uh, the rocky soil, as soon as they hear the word, they receive it with joy. But it's not because they're good soil. It's because they're shallow soil. That's what he goes on to explain. He says, but they have no root in themselves and do not endure. So while there is quick life, there's also quick death here. So the quick life uh, is not because of how good the soil it is, but it's actually in response to how bad the soil it is and because of how shallow the soil is because of these rocks. And so um, they have no root in themselves and do not endure. Then when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, because of the gospel, because of the Christian faith, immediately they fall away. So... These are people that, uh, and it lists it right here in the text, they don't endure. There's not a perseverance of their faith uh, when trouble, when persecution comes because of the word. So the sufferings of life, this makes me think of uh, the, the famous agnostic atheist, uh, Bart Ehrman, right? He speaks of the suffering that drove him away from faith along with doubting the inerrancy of scripture. We could we could give many, many examples, but, but people have this concept of Christianity that, there's not going to be any persecution or there's not going to be any ostracizement of them from those who are not in Christ or, or the idea that uh, it's your best life now. It's going to be simple. It's going to be great. God's going to bless you right here on the earth. It's not something that's waiting for heaven. It's something that begins now. And, and this is so contrary to the scriptures. Uh, Jesus said, uh, whoever will follow me must take up their, their cross with me. Now, he doesn't say... Um, you know, whoever will follow me will experience their, their best life now. These things are opposites. Jesus's message, he had no place to lay his head. He had, um, he was killed on a cross, right? With with maybe pastors today that make millions of dollars and, and are greedy and, and uh, teach foolish uh, people who attend their services and don't read their Bibles and don't know any better, uh, like sheep without a shepherd. So, um, Keep, keep that in mind. Um, this shallow faith, when, when trouble or persecution comes become a, because of the word, uh, they fall away. People think that accepting Jesus is going to free them from any hard circumstance or challenge to ever happen in their life. And that's just not promised. Jesus promises the opposite. The prosperity gospel, the word of faith movement, these kinds of things, they're antithetical to the gospel. They're in a sharp contradiction. They are opposites. Jesus' message and the message maybe of the word of faith or, or the prosperity gospel, there is no correlating of these two. They, they are antithetical. They are opposite. Um, there's no overlap here. While there is blessing here on this earth, it's not blessing in the sense of the world. It's blessing in the sense that Jesus taught us. Um, so that's what I'll say about that and get off my soapbox. They have no root in themselves, do not endure, 
which is vital, essential to salvation. Um, the one who perseveres to the end is saved, not one who gives up the faith. Uh, those people aren't saved. Then when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, immediately they fall away. Uh, that's the uh, third type of uh, soil, I believe, second type of soil. Yeah, second type. Um, verse 18, it says, uh, Others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but worldly cares, the seduction of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it produces nothing. So in this third analogy of, of bad soil, uh, this third parable, um, it is the one that, that's sown among thorns and thistles. It, it's, it's able to grow, just like the one on the rock can grow, but it's got no roots. Um, and, and likewise, that plant will die if, if a storm comes or hits or something, it'll be torn out of the ground. Uh, just as likewise, um, this other soil, while it may be able to go deeper in its roots, uh, it's going to be choked out that the thorns and the thistles around this, it's not going to allow it to spread. It's not going to allow it to grow as tall as it needs to be. And Jesus' explanation of this parable is that it is, um, as it says, let's see, verse 18 and 19, they are the ones who hear the word, but worldly cares, the seduction or seductiveness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word. So Jesus' three-pronged uh, explanation of this is uh, the seductiveness of wealth. Uh, money is so seductive, and it draws so many Christians away. I already mentioned the prosperity gospel movement. Um, it, it's pairing God's uh, desires and call with the opposite, with the with the seduction of wealth and etc. But uh, this leads many astray, and, and they're no longer willing to follow Christ to the degree at which he calls us to follow him, to be willing to give up anything and everything, because they want wealth. People want money. Um, also, uh, worldly cares. The first thing he mentions in verse 19, this is the things that, that the Bible talks about. We all have needs. We all have need for clothes. We all have need for food. Uh, we have needs as human beings, and so as the gospels tell us elsewhere, our father in heaven knows that we have these needs and he tells us to seek first the kingdom of heaven. And he says, all these things will be added to you. Focus on my kingdom. I'll take care of your, your proverbial essential needs. Um, and so people who get so caught up in the worldly cares uh, that everyone's caught up with Jew and Gentile, uh, saved and lost, uh, people who know Christ and are far from Christ, um, it draws them away from their, their commitment to Christ. And then lastly, the desire for other things. Um, today in our age, this is more rampant than ever. Um, we, we are so fixed on so many things. Uh, we're more concerned with sports or with uh, money or with our job or with uh, some kind of hobby. There's an endless list of idols that we form for ourselves, but we put things over and above the Lord and his mission and his call in our life. And, and these are things that, that ultimately will lead to, uh, at best, um, this will lead to you barely making it in heaven. Uh, at best, this will lead to you, as Corinthians says, uh, barely making it in, uh, but all your work is burned up. And at worst, it, it lands you into apostasy um, if uh, this is pursued. So there can be, I think, and I was wrestling with this this passage, and I read through the book of Hebrews as I was reading this and, and studying for this, and I'll show you why here in the text, but um, there is a sense in that it seems that there's a progression from unbelief to uh, evilness to apostasy or abandoning the faith, not being saved anymore. It seems like there's a progression here, but there is uh, room in the scriptures for people to make it to heaven that have no fruit. Or if this is your, your mentality, your path, like, well, I'm not really going to make disciples. I'm not really going to share my faith. I'm not really going to grow maturity, but, but I'll go to heaven. Th this is so opposite of, of the mark of a Christian. And you should be really concerned if that's your, your attitude of your salvation. I would really challenge you to uh, wrestle through that. Um, but ultimately, um, as this says, so with the rocky soil, it says that... Uh, 
trouble or persecution comes because of the word, immediately they fall away. This isn't a mark of a Christian. This is a mark of someone who leaves the faith, who's no longer in the covenant with Christ. Likewise, others sown among the thorns there, those who hear the word, the worldly uh, cares, the seduction, seductiveness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it produces nothing. This isn't a mark of Christian fruitfulness, something uh, Jesus said that the way you uh, prove to be my disciples is that you bear much fruit. So if you bear no fruit, you're proving to not be a disciple. So like I said, there is, <laughs> there is like a small sliver of a chance for those who don't have fruit to make it into heaven. But the majority of people who have no fruit are not going to be in heaven because they're not genuinely converted or saved. They're false converts. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, that's not the goal at all. And if that's your goal, it really is revealing of the emptiness in your, your heart and, and life and commitment to Christ. Um, so uh, with that, I wanted to mention the, the passage in Hebrews because there's so much correlation here. So the way he describes the third type of soil that uh, ultimately uh, withers, he says, um, as he, he says earlier in this passage, uh, the soil is not deep for the rocky soil. Uh, then the sun comes up, it scorched, and because it did not have sufficient root, it withered. So this is for the rocky soil. So the rocky soil is pictured as dying, of withering, of, of no longer existing. So th this doesn't seem to be a mark of a Christian and abundant uh, Christian fruit. The, the next uh, parable, um, excuse me, the next uh, soil here within the parable of thorny soil, um, in his teaching to the crowd, he says, uh, fell among the thorns, grew out and choked it, it doesn't produce grain. So there's no fruit that is produced here. And so like, like I said before, there does seem to be possibility for salvation, but it's gonna be just barely. And I don't think it's gonna be for all of the group of people that fall there, just for the percentage that is genuinely uh, believers there. but but you know, we're disobedient in following Christ. And that's just not a line I would encourage anyone flirting with, but I think there's room for it. But I, I, I said, like I said, the majority of people that would fall into that, that camp, I don't think will be uh, saved clearly. And that's what the scripture teaches. The correlation to this passage, to the Hebrew passage, um, I'll just uh, read, I believe it's in uh, chapter six. Let's see, there it is. Um, and this is concerning apostasy. Chapter 6 of Hebrews, verse 4 through verse 8. It is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, become partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted the good word of God and the miracles of the coming age, and then have committed apostasy after, right, this conversion, uh, to renew them again to repentance, because they've already had a repentance, since they are crucifying uh, the Son of God for themselves all over again because they already crucified him when they first accepted and holding him up to contempt uh, for the ground that has soaked up the rain. So here's where I'm drawing the connection here in God's word in, in his New Testament. Um, for the ground that has soaked up the rain, and also this has implications, I believe, to uh, the book of Isaiah, but nevertheless, for the ground that has soaked up the rain that frequently falls on it and yields useful vegetation for those who tend it, uh, receive a blessing from God. Okay, so good soil that produces fruit uh, receives a blessing from God, but if it produces thorns and thistles, just like we read in Mark chapter four, it is useless. And, and here's where I'm saying this is very dangerous territory for apostasy, even though in the uh, crowd teaching in Mark chapter 4 and in the Jesus's explanation of the crowd teaching of the parable of the soils, well, it doesn't explicitly say that, all, all that it says that there's no fruit born, but here it says if it produces thorns and thistles, it is useless and about to be cursed. This isn't the mark of a Christian. This isn't how God speaks of his saints, of his children, and even goes as far to say its fate is to be burned there at the end of verse eight, a clear reference to eternal damnation, uh, eternal hell. And so 
take that for what it's worth. I see a very, very, very clear correlation parallel here. I don't know how you could miss it. It's straight from the mouth of Jesus and straight pointed back here in Hebrews. So uh, take, take that with um, some real consideration and real warning there. Um, it's the same reference here. Uh, so with that being said, I, those are the four soils. There is, um, and of course, the, the last one, I don't think I read. Uh, these are the, the ones sown on good soil. Um, the, that they uh, hear the word and receive it and bear fruit 130 times as much, 160 and 100. So notice that the good soil, uh, they not only receive the word, they hear the gospel message, but they bear fruit. So much of our, our misconception in, in American Christianity is that faithful Christian living is you attend church once a week on a Sunday, so long as your schedule permits. And this is so contrary to what Jesus taught us. Jesus, Jesus is uh, Christianity. Most people here in America would not follow if Jesus was right in front of their teaching uh, them what it would cost them. But because so many pastors are, are scared of or unwilling to preach God's word, God's truth, God's commitment level for discipleship, uh, people can, we, we multiply the tears among the wheat, we multiply the, the, the bad soil and don't drive that off with good preaching. And so, um, you know, good fruit uh, comes from good soil and good soil produces fruit. They hear the word and receive it and bear fruit. That's the mark of good soil. Disciples make disciples. So if you say I'm a true disciple, but you're not involved in the business of multiplying God's kingdom, you're not sharing your faith, you're not uh, raising others up in the faith, what marks do you truly have of a disciple? Um, as I, I stated earlier, that, that verse, uh, verse I memorized is that um, the ones who prove to be Jesus' disciples are the ones who bear fruit, straight out of the mouth of Jesus. So uh, if you don't have any fruit in your life, uh, it's a dangerous place to be and should be revealing, should concern you and cause you to rethink your uh, relationship with the Lord. Um, so it says one type uh, 30 times as much, one type 60 times as much, one 100 times as much. So uh, keep those passages in mind. And I want to explain here why Jesus used parables. Um, in verse uh, 10 of chapter 4, it says, uh, When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. We just explained how he taught those, uh, those four soils and how he explained them. He said to them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. So what was veiled in the Old Testament, what was dimly lit in the Old Testament, what was spoken of, in secret or in mystery in the Old Testament now was being revealed in Jesus' day and age and has been clearly taught and revealed to uh, his 12 and his disciples. To the crowds, uh, it wasn't clearly taught, but to his true disciples, it was clearly taught. He says, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those outside, outside of the kingdom of God, the crowd, he wasn't taking their commitment um, as as a genuine commitment. He was seeing in them um, uh, the emptiness. He, he knew amongst these large crowds that are following me, there's uh, rocky soil, there's thorny soil, there's straight up hardness of heart on the path. And there's good soil within that, but, but there's also these other soils. And so he says to those outside, that's what he means, outside of the kingdom currently, outside of the faith, everything is in parables. Why? Well, he quotes Isaiah here. He says, so that although they look, they may look, but not see. And although they hear, they may hear, but not understand, so that they may not repent and be forgiven. And this is from Isaiah chapter 6, when, when God commissions Isaiah to go out uh, and preach as a prophet. He says, go and tell these people, listen continually, but don't understand. Look continually, but don't perceive make the hearts of these people calloused, make their ears deaf and their eyes blind. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and their hearts might understand and they might repent and be healed. Really what's going on here seems to be sarcasm and what God is doing is pronouncing judgment in the Isaiah chapter six passage and Jesus likewise is referencing Isaiah to say, I'm preaching judgment on the crowds. And he's doing this because of 
they're not all good soil. And so he wants them to hear the preaching and he wants them to hear the teaching of the parables, but only the people that are really truly uh, wanting to learn, only really truly wanting to become followers of him and to lay down their life to follow him, those are going to be the people that the Holy Spirit then can enable their understanding to be able to see, to hear, and really grasp the teaching of the kingdom of God. And for those who the commitment's not there, the willingness to follow Christ's not there, the um, worthiness of being willing to follow him at any cost, when that's not there, it's just a weird story and they just move on with their life. They saw some cool miracles and they go on about their life. The judgment of God is pronounced upon them and, um, and they continue in their blindness because their unwillingness to become a true disciple. Um, and so Jesus really in his parables, he's pronouncing judgment to his own people that they should uh, clearly have saw many things. And one of the other reasons that he speaks in parables is because uh, Jesus realizes that they've missed so much and they've been given more than any other nation. They, they are the chosen people of God. But although that they are the chosen people of God, I'm reminded of Paul in Romans 9, they have the oracles of God, they have the word of God, they have so many things and they're still missing it. Um, and so uh, Jesus is pronouncing judgment on them and uh, that's why he speaks in parables because um, people that want to understand are going to seek him out. And people that don't want to understand, uh, he's they're just going to move on with their life and he's just going to leave it clouded and they're content to not learn or care or or understand or follow and for those people uh you know it, it's just a judgment on them so he goes on to say in verse 21 further explaining these things don't disconnect this chapter with itself he says he also said to them a lamp isn't brought to be put under a basket or under a bed is it um, the literal greek is a, is a candle uh, isn't it to be placed on a lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, and nothing concealed except to be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, he had better listen. So uh, he uses this analogy. He's explaining himself truly as the one light, uh, the light of all men that has come to earth. And uh, he's, he's also explaining to his disciples the depth of his teaching, the, the spiritual truth within his teaching, and he wants uh, them to, you know, as it says elsewhere in the New Testament, what I, what I whisper in secret, pronounce on the rooftops. Um, he's trying to, in some senses, preserve his ministry because as soon as, um, as soon as he speaks a certain enough amount, he's going to be crucified. He's going to be accused of blasphemy and put to death. So in some ways, he's preserving his ministry so that he can reach more people. In other ways, he's pronouncing judgment through parables. And in other ways, um, he's also trying to teach things that, that have been thoroughly missed in the Old Testament. And so what he means by uh, a lamp isn't brought to be put under a light, uh, excuse me, under a basket, he's talking about the, the really the reality of light and, and the fact that, you know, any kind of light, a candle, um, a, a night light, uh, your phone light, you don't cover it up. You're trying to bring light to darkness. And for that, you put it on display. You move everything out of the way so that light can shine into the corners of the room. And he says, verse 22, nothing is hidden except to be revealed. So what was concealed in the Old Testament, he's now revealing here in his day and age. Nothing was concealed in the Old Testament except to be brought to light. And if anyone has ears to hear, he had better listen. And so Jesus is, as he stated before in this chapter, he's revealing the great mystery. He's revealing the great secret of the kingdom of God. He's just giving us another parable to explain that reality. If anyone has ears to hear, he'd better listen. And he said to them, take care about what you hear. The measure you use will be measure, the measure you receive, and more will be added to you. For whoever uh, has will be given more, but whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him. This passage is really important. What he's speaking to here is the, the need for people to open their hearts and their minds to his teaching. Um, that's why he says, take care about what you hear. Like, really, like he's God literally on earth dropping wisdom and dropping theology and dropping truth. 
and um, he, he's wanting them to take it seriously. And what he means by the measure you use will be the measure you receive, the, the extent to which you are willing to receive his truth, his word, his understanding, his gospel, um, is the measure at which you'll be able to uh, live it out, the measure at which you'll be uh, guided and gifted by the Holy Spirit in understanding. And um, he also says that um, the measure you use will be the measure you receive. He's using like a, a common first century concept of, of uh, bartering of, um, you know, you trade me this much of this and I'll trade you this much of that. And more will be added to you. So as we see in the parable of the talents or we see in other parables, um, there's a discrepancy of blessings. There, there's uh, certain people that are faithful and little and he gives them more. And there's certain people that are unfaithful and little and he takes it away. And so uh, as he says in verse 25, whoever has will be given more, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And so uh, the one who has understanding, who has godliness, um, in the age to come in heaven, they will be given more, uh, be put in charge of more, uh, be blessed more. And whoever does not have the, the one uh, who has only heard but not responded, even that will be taken away from him in, in the final judgment. I think that's what this is speaking to. Other uh, gospels uh, go into different details with this, this uh, short little section of scripture. So last, uh, we have the parable of the growing seed, uh, the mustard seed and then the uh, story of the disciples on the boat. So uh, he also said, the kingdom of God is like someone who spreads seed on the ground. And so he's giving us a different analogy, excuse me, a similar analogy for a different teaching. So uh, keep the parable of the sower in mind, but but don't extend that. This is a different parable. It says, uh, the kingdom of God is like someone who spreads seed on the ground. He goes to sleep and gets up night and day. And the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. By itself, the soil produces a crop, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. And when the grain is ripe, he sends in the sickle because the harvest has come. So he, he's giving this uh, really wise teaching concerning gospel preachers who should be every Christian, that when we share the gospel, um, it's not us who makes it produced fruit. Our job is just seed scattering, but it's actually God. It's it's the, the soil's response and God himself who work together to produce a crop. So it's not the, um, the sower's fault if a soil is good or if it's thorny or if it's rocky or if it's just a path. You know, the, the sower has no control over that. That's the soil's choice. But um, what we do have control over is faithful teaching and faithful sharing. But even for the good, for the good soil, that's not of our doing either. It says, verse 28, by itself the soil produces a crop, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. So uh, even the whatever fruit that, that our lives may bear, ministry ultimately is the work of the Lord. And we're rewarded for faithfulness and, and, and uh, obedience, but uh, ultimately it is uh, also between them and the Lord. Uh, it's our, just our job to be faithful. So notice the emphasis in this section on the crop itself doing the work. So I can share the gospel, I can teach the Bible, but someone has to respond to that and live in light of that, and I can't control that. And likewise, uh, God has to work. The Holy Spirit has to work in that situation, and I can't cause that either. So that's why we almost get like a lazy, lazy farmer just scattering seed because uh, the work of the ministry, what we do in, in sharing the faith and spreading the gospel uh, it's limited to that to some degree. Now we can disciple and we're called to, uh, but that, that's up to their response. So we can't, uh, ultimately, I don't choose who I disciple. It, I find who I disciple based on who's responding and who's uh, welcoming God's, God's kingdom into their life. So uh, when the grain is ripe, he sends the sickle because the harvest has come. He's seeming to speak to the end of time. Uh, other parables, he, he explains by saying that uh, angels will reap the harvest of people at the end of the age. He goes on to say, uh, he asks like a rhetorical question. He also asks verse 30, to what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable can we use to present it? He's almost like publicly saying like, how else can I explain this to you? It's like a mustard seed, which are very tiny, a, a tenth of an inch. 
that when sown in the ground, even though it is the smallest of all the seeds in the ground, when it is sown, it grows up, becomes the greatest of all garden plants, and grows large because, uh, excuse me, and grows large branches so that the wild birds can nest in its shade. Um, so a mustard seed, they say that big ones can grow up to uh, 10 feet like a shrub. Uh, and so Jesus is using something in, in his day and age um, in his surrounding area so that people will understand. So he uses the tininess of a mustard seed to explain the, uh, how much that little seed can abundantly grow into um, just a, a huge, huge uh, tree or a huge branch that, that uh, even wild birds can nest in its shade. And there's some speculation as to what these wild birds are. I'm not going to venture. Uh, it could be talking about tares among the wheat. It could as well be talking about uh, Gentiles among uh, God's people uh, currently. Uh, one of, is one of the two, but I, I'm not entirely sure. But uh, as well, um, you know, Jesus, this one person, uh, these small acts of faith can, can then really multiply when, when God is blessing it and, and yield these massive crops 30 times, 60 times, 100 times uh, what, what was sown. And uh, just likewise, that little mustard seed uh, can turn into a magnificent tree. And so uh, it's important to keep that in mind uh, and not get discouraged. Verse 33, so with many parables like these, uh, he spoke the word to them and they were able to hear. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately explained everything to his own disciples. So we talked about that extensively earlier in this chapter, why he did that. And also keep in mind, he did explain it exhaustively, but that was particular to his uh, disciples, not to the crowds. And that was because he was skeptical of the crowds. He was also pronouncing judgment on the crowds. Um, Verse 35, we get this last story. It says, on that day, so within the same day after this exhaustive, uh, extensive teaching, it says, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go across to the other side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee. So after leaving the crowd, they took him along just as he was in the boat and other boats were with him. Now a great windstorm developed and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was nearly swamped. So um, it then goes on to say, verse 38, but he was in the stern or the back of the boat, uh, sleeping on a cushion. They awoke him uh, up and said to him, teacher, don't you care that we're about to die? So Jesus has just finished uh, a full day of ministry. It's not evening. Uh, you can imagine he is exhausted. He decides to take a nap in the back of the boat and on their way to where they're going, here, this massively violent storm, uh, windstorm comes up. It's blowing so much water into the boat that it's swamped it. It's probably even beginning to sink. And uh, once they're beginning to be so freaked out, they wake up Jesus and they're scolding him. They're angry with him. Don't you care? We're about to die. They're really complaining and griping. And it says, uh, verse 39, so he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, be quiet, calm down. And then the wind stopped and it was dead calm. And I couldn't help but to think of uh, this passage. It's in Psalm 107. And I just wanted to, to read some of this to you. It says, uh, they lost their appetite for all food and they drew near to the gates of death. They cried out to the Lord in their distress and he delivered them from their troubles. He sent them an assuring word and healed them. He rescued them from the pits they were trapped. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loyal love and for the amazing things he has done for his people. Uh, let them present thank offerings and loudly proclaim what he has done. And then notice this part in, in chapter uh, 107, verse 23 of the Psalms. Some traveled on the sea in ships and carried cargo over the vast waters. They witnessed the acts of the Lord, his amazing feats on the deep water. He gave the order for a windstorm uh, and it stirred up the waves of the sea. They reached up to the sky. They dropped uh, onto the depths, into the depths. The sailors' strength left them because the danger was so great. So verse 27 says, they swayed and staggered like a drunk and all their skill proved ineffective. And here's where there's, so, there's just so much parallel with the story of Jesus calming the storm. And I can't help but, but not... Uh, 
miss this in the Old Testament. Um, it says they, they cried out to the Lord in their distress. He delivered them from their troubles. He calmed the storm and the waves grew silent. Uh, and then it says the sailors rejoiced because the waves grew quiet and he led them uh, to the harbor they desired. Um, I, like I said, this isn't explicit um, prophecy or anything like that, but it is the Psalms and, and uh, it does seem to speak of the Lord causing a storm, a windstorm, and, and, and the Lord, uh, you know, causing uh, the group of the sailors to freak out, and then also the Lord calming the storm. So maybe fulfilled prophecy, uh, there's extreme parallel here. I don't think we should miss this. So um, he gets up from his nap, uh, he rebukes the wind, and said to the sea, be quiet, calm down. Can you just imagine this? The wind stopped and was dead calm. And he said to them, why are you uh, cowardly? Do you still not have faith? They were overwhelmed by fear and said to one another, who is this? Even the wind and sea obey him. Um, and so, like I said, uh, I wonder if they would know the Psalms to know Psalm 107, to know that the Lord, of course they know the Lord God, Yahweh is in charge of the sea and can, can cause it to storm or to stop. Uh, but, but they're beginning to ask questions as we talk about these first eight chapters in Mark. Uh, it's building up some identity of who Jesus is and the disciples are not quite sure yet. And uh, who is this that even the wind and sea obey him? And uh, so, He's beginning to do more miraculous works that uh, he's not just healing anymore. Uh, this has been done in Old Testament times. Now he's, he's directly speaking to the wind and the waves to rebuke them, to cause it to stop. And so if you can imagine how terrifying that would be to, to witness that and who exactly is this that's in our boat, uh, someone very powerful. Um, so uh, he rebukes their, their uh, fear and says, you know, don't you know who I am almost? Do you still not have faith? Um, because earlier, of course, they wake him up and they're like, don't you care we're about to die? And he's like, don't you get it? Don't you know who you're in the boat with? But uh, anyways, that's all of chapter four. Um, really important stuff. Uh, the parable of the sower is so important. I really challenge you to pray on those things, study these things, meditate on them, and also... Um, I'd also challenge you to, to be a faithful soil, good soil, uh, one who is sensitive to God's word, one who has ears to hear and eyes to see. And that's up to you, what kind of soil you are. So really challenge you with that to uh, really take that to heart. And I pray this blesses you. Um, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you for Mark chapter five.